He can't do it without your votes. And so I hope after this evening, all of you will sign up and help us elect Jeb as the next president of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for your support and for your leadership here. Michael Shurtoff is a patriot. He was a prosecutor. He was a federal judge. He, was, uh, he protected the homeland in a really difficult job, and he's a friend. Uh, I worked with him uh, in 2004 and 2005 when he was secretary, and I happened to be governor of a state that had eight hurricanes, four tropical storms, 150 plus billion dollars of insured and uninsured losses, homes more than a million, 200,000 homes that were either completely damaged or damaged to the point where people couldn't live in them. We had, trust me, it was a big darn deal, as we say in Florida. And I'm proud of the fact that the federal partnership worked there. You didn't hear people complaining about the response when we got hit by Katrina and the other seven hurricanes. Because leadership matters. It matters across the board. A leader doesn't blame the other person. A leader doesn't do what our children occasionally do, which is to say, the dog ate my homework. I'm sorry, I didn't do my math this, this today. A leader accepts responsibility, rolls up their sleeves, forges consensus, and fixes things. And working with Michael Shurtoff made it possible for me to do that as governor, where I got to act on my heart for the people that I really loved and cared for. And I'm proud of the fact that we went through these storms, unprecedented. Never has that ever happened to any state. And we recovered at a faster rate than anybody could ever imagine. And we did it, by and large, without a whole lot of criticism. Don't you want Washington to work that way again? Don't you want Washington to work in a way that we're proud? Beth, thank you for that kind introduction. I want to recognize uh, President Morse, who is doing an extraordinary job as president of the, the, of the New Hampshire Senate. He has, he's got a 5.30 plane tomorrow. And he doesn't live around here. At least, you know, every, everybody says New Hampshire is kind of a small t t uh, state. I don't think it's that small. I've been traveling all over the place. <laughs> it's a pretty good distance from where he lives in Salem to, uh, to be here. But he came up to show his support and he is a principle-centered leader as well, and I just appreciate your friendship and support as well. Look, we're living in extraordinary times, in dangerous times. If it wasn't, if everything was just rolling along well, then you could probably say, let's take a bet on the big guy on the stage. Let's just, you know, let's just go for it. Everything will work out. This country's growing and everything's fine, but that's not what's happening. We're living in dangerous times. We're living in times where people have lost hope for themselves and their families. We're living in times where the middle class now is perpetually seeing declines in their income. Sadly, we're living in times from the day that Barack Obama was inaugurated where six and a half million people more are living in poverty. And today, as people think about America's strength and whether we're secure, a growing number of people correctly say we're not because America's leadership is lacking in the world. And when we pull back, voids are filled. They're filled by nation states that see us now as weak and vacillating, and they take, they take two steps forward when we timidly take steps back. And now we have these new asymmetric threats of terror that are uniquely different. A caliphate the size of Indiana with 30 to 40,000 terrorists, Islamic radical terrorists, because that's what they are, that are organized to destroy Western civilization and can do it in all sorts of ways, most particularly by focusing on what they perceive to be our weakness, which is our liberty and our freedom. There's a lot riding now. And I believe people in New Hampshire, most particularly, are going to say, hey, we have a lot of influence in this process. We're first in the nation. We actually make the candidates walk over the hot coals. We don't, set, we don't sign up the first time we meet them. Sometimes we don't sign up until maybe the fifth time we meet them, right, Bev? That's New Hampshire. That's the way it is, and I admire that. Because I think every candidate ought to be able to be tested, have questions come at them from all different directions, to show their mettle, 
to show what their depth of knowledge is, to show their heart, to show their strength, to show their, their, their conviction. And my bet is that the people in New Hampshire are not going to tarnish their incredible reputation of being discerning voters and tarnish the first in the nation primary status. And that's why I'm here, to make the case that we need proven leadership during these difficult times. In August, I had a chance to lay out a strategy to deal with, deal with ISIS. This was before the Paris attacks. This was before the Russian plane was shot down by ISIS supporters in the Sinai. This was before the attacks all around the world, including the tragedy of Paris, and most particularly the tragedy in San Bernardino. After that, all sorts of candidates were scurrying around saying what they would do, changing their views that they had in August or in the summer. They, were, they scurried around. They were talking about carpet bombing now and other things like that to show that they were strong, you know, so that they, were, that they really had thought it through. Well, here's what I said in August prior to all this, that this was a national security threat for our country, first and foremost. Not every case is that the case, but this is because they are organized to destabilize us, to attack us in ways that will freeze us in place, make it harder for us to be able to lead the world and to create a more secure United States. My strategy started with arming the Kurds directly. This administration refuses to do that. They are our strongest allies. They're the best fighters in Iraq. We should arm them directly and give them confidence that the United States has their back. Secondly, we ought to engage with the Iraqi military, which we have not done. Other countries have. We should embed our troops that are already in Iraq inside the Iraqi military to train them, to fortify them, to give them confidence so that they can be successful as well. Third, we need to re-engage with the Sunni tribal leaders who felt abandoned when the, this administration, led by Secretary of State Clinton and President Obama, abandoned the Sunni partnership that created a fragile secure, though, secure Iraq because of the surge. Fourth, we need to get the damn lawyers off the backs of the war fighters. This is ridiculous what we have to do now. Sorties leave bases in the Middle East to attack ISIS, and half of them go back because they haven't gotten approval, layers of approval that is required. The United States will always adhere to the international standards of war fighting. But why should we impose additional restrictions, endangering our troops, by the way, by putting these restrictions on, as though this was a law enforcement exercise? My friends, this is not a law enforcement exercise. They have declared war on us, and we need to fight a war against them. That is the strategy when you combine that with safe zones inside of Syria, for those, and my heart breaks for the, the four million refugees that have been uprooted inside of Syria, four million refugees. They're now in camps in Turkey, in Lebanon, and in Jordan. The way to solve that problem isn't to send them off to far off lands, including our country, it's to create safe zones inside of Syria and provide protection there and allow us to build a military force that will be Sunni led with American training, with Arab support, with the world supporting it to destroy ISIS and bring about stability by, dis by taking, bringing about regime change in Syria. And that requires a no-fly zone as well. That, my friends, is a strategy. It's not reacting to events as they come, but it's thinking it through. Here's a little insight into this that I hope you appreciate. I know what I don't know. I admit it. I feel better now. Just, it feels like I've given myself therapy. I hope you want a president that recognizes in complex world, the best thing to do is to acknowledge what you don't know and then go seek out the best information possible. That's how it works. That's how leaders lead. They don't lead by saying, I'm the big guy on the stage. I'll disparage everybody. I'll take care of it. Just blanket kind of big talk. That's not how leaders operate. Leaders operate by creating strategies and then having the dogged determination to stick with it. And I believe I have those skills to do it and I hope that you understand that I've thought these things through. I believe we can destroy ISIS and we can create a more stable Middle East which will be in our national security interest. And if we get that right, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in Washington, D.C. for our country's sake as well. Declining income in this country should not be the norm. It should not be the norm. It should be our highest priority to make sure the middle class that defines 
who we are as a nation, in fact, has, has, has defined our greatness, begins to rise up again. And that means we need to have the courage to change the culture in Washington, D.C. Let me give you another insight. I don't think that people that disagree with me are bad people. I just think they might be wrong. <laughs> and trust me, there's a huge difference. If you start with the premise that people that disagree with you have bad motives, or they're evil, or they're, they're stupid, or whatever it is, you get a bad result. And over the last seven years, we've had a president who whenever he's had a chance to use his extraordinary skills, it consistently is to push people down that disagree with him to make himself look better. I, for one, am sick and tired of this because he's creating a divide that is hurting our country. And I, like you, love this country. And if we love it, we better start forging consensus to unite around common purpose rather than constantly be dividing us. If you're President Obama and someone disagrees with you on the Iranian agreement, and I for one believe it's one of the worst agreements ever negotiated, that it'll create instability in the region, that it rewards a regime that is not deserving of rewards, a regime that is the largest sponsor of terrorism in the world, that isn't going to isn't necessarily going to open up their country. Mullahs don't go quietly into the night. That naive notion has already been rejected by Iran themselves. They've already made it clear that whatever the deal was, that's fine, but we're never going to negotiate anything more with the United States. And that upheaval is wrong. And President Obama says to people that disagree with him that they're part of the, they're, they're in cahoots with the death to America crowd. How wrong can you be? Why not just assume for a moment that people might have a principled difference of opinion? And in Washington, D.C., we need to start at least, at least where we have consensus begin to solve problems. Let the atrophy of, of lack of consensus begin to, to change, where we start exercising the consensus muscles perhaps a little bit so we can start fixing the things that are important to fix. There's a bipartisan consensus on entitlement reform. There's a bipartisan consensus, I know in my heart, on shifting power away from Washington so we can create 21st century rules around our economy. There is a consensus on embracing an energy revolution that will create high sustained economic growth and higher wages. But it's going to require a president who doesn't start off each day assuming that people are his enemy to disparage them and to push them down to make themselves look better. A sign of strength in my mind is to stop the divide. It's to build consensus. And if we were going to build consensus, I would argue that 4% economic growth should be our aspirational goal. And we can do it. America's done it in the past, and there's no reason in the world that we can't do it again. Don't let the naysayer say the new normal of 2% growth is acceptable. 2% growth means rising poverty. 2% growth means median income will be in decline. 2% growth means increasing demands on government. 2% growth means we'll have double-digit increases in people receiving food stamps. And the divide in our country and the social cost associated with that is unacceptable for a great nation like ours. The final thing I want to say to you is that I believe that life is precious, that it's a gift from God. I hope people aren't offended by that notion. Because it is. Look, if you believe like I do, that life is precious, that it's, it's divinely inspired, that everybody has a role to play, that everybody can make a contribution, which I truly believe, then you don't organize society around a bigger government, more regulations. You don't say, you've got problems. It's not your fault. I'll take care of you from Washington, D.C. That's what the left does. That's what Hillary Clinton has promised us, more of the same more rules, more taxes, more spending. I'll take care of you. If you start from the premise that everybody has a chance to reach their God-given abilities, then you have the opposite kind of view about the role of government. It should build capacity for people to achieve earned success. I want, a pres I want to be president to tear down the ceilings of people's aspirations. I don't want to tell them what line to get into. I want to tell them, whatever your dream is, let's make sure you have the capacity to pursue those dreams. And whether you achieve the dreams or not is not as important as the pursuit. That's my life lesson. 
It's, a, it's, it's learning through trial and error how to be a better person, a better husband, a better father. It is the pursuit of life that matters. And a conservative will never win if we play the game that the left plays by pushing people down that, that disagree with us. We have to campaign with our arms wide open, with a hopeful, optimistic message, with a, with a belief, a basic belief, that the greatness of this country is not through its government. It's through the interaction of 300 million plus people with the capacity to achieve their own dreams. Imagine an America where everybody is in pursuit of their own dreams. The interaction of all of us together will create more prosperity, more innovation, more love, more compassion, more creativity, more goodwill, more everything that we desperately want than any government program ever created. I think that is an aspiration worth fighting for, and it's why I come here to ask for your vote. You in New, New Hampshire, as I said, will make the difference. If you decide that you want a candidate representing the Republican Party that is an agitator, that only preys on people's fears, then it probably will happen. And if that happens, I can promise you this. Hillary Clinton will be elected President of the United States. And if you think things are bad today, imagine what it would be like for eight more years, possibly, of the same thing, of pushing people down, of dividing, of creating no opportunities for people, of abdicating the possibilities of allowing people to be successful on their own terms in their own ways. This is worth fighting for. And I intend to fight to the bitter end, and I hope that you'll join me. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. I feel the warmth already. I was a little nervous when I first got to the hotel. It looked like the heater was on, but it's already coming. Yes, sir. We got microphones on both sides. Governor, I have uh, two questions, actually. One okay. A little lighthearted. <laughs> did you call your mother and father to wish them happy? <laughs> Thank God I did. I'm glad I could answer that honestly. <laughs> Yeah, and my dad said, uh, my mom said, boy, thank you. That's so nice. She's gotten all sweet all of a sudden. I'm getting a little nervous. Uh, my, my dad said, Jeb, it doesn't feel like a day over 70 years that we've been married. They've, they've been married 71 years. That's his standard joke. Each year he raises another. And I said, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to do something romantic with mom, age 91 and 90? And she, yeah, he said, yeah, we're, I'm watching a, uh, we're watching a mystery movie at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's very romantic. <laughs> I hope they were. I also want to get your uh, uh, two-part question a, a little more serious. What are your feelings about Common Core and what are your feelings about the Department of Education? Sure, Common Core standards have been poisoned by a political environment that it, it sounds, you know, Common Core effectively means different things to different people. So I'll tell you what I'm not for. That'll make it simpler. I'm not for the federal government being involved in the creation of standards, content, or curriculum, directly or indirectly. And recently, the K-12 law was reauthorized like six or seven years late, typical again in Washington. And in that bill that passed, the president signed a bipartisan support Majority of both parties in both House and Senate passed it. That hardly happens either. And it expressly prohibited the federal government being involved in the creation of content or, st or curriculum or standards. So uh, I think the people's voices were heard on this regard. Now, let me tell you what I'm for, because I think that's as important as well. I'm for high standards. I'm for as high, st I want standards to be high that when you assess them, you know whether a student is college and or career ready by the end of the journey. They should be, it should be locally driven, the strategies to make sure that happens, and the state drives the policy. Today in New Hampshire, today in Florida, tr today in this country, no more than 40% of our kids are truly college and or career ready. Now, for those who think, well, we're not spending enough money, Maybe, maybe in some school districts, because union contracts of 20 years ago basically sucked the money out of the classroom. That's probably true. But the simple fact is, on a per-student basis, we spend more per student than any country in the world other than, I think, Belgium and Luxembourg, literally, 
a couple of rounding errors in terms of student population. So who's fooling who? Are we just going to accept, you know, one side says we just need local control, the other side says, you know, we, we, don't, we, we shouldn't have any standards and accountability around it. I believe that we ought to have a robust, reform-oriented, state-driven education system with local control driving the policy, but everybody ought to be held to account. Because if you're getting only 40%, and I'm being generous here, 40% of your children graduating from high school or not graduating at all, sadly, and they're not college or career ready, what life are they going to live? Well, they're going to play tight end for the New England Patriots? No, that, that job's already taken. Gronkowski's doing a fine job with that. <laughs> this has to be a national calling from the bottom up. Florida, we did that. We created the first statewide voucher program, the second statewide voucher program, and the third. I took on very powerful teachers' union interest and the bureaucracies that hated it. But guess what? Because we graded schools in a way that everybody understood, we ended social promotion in third grade, this insidious idea that functionally illiterate kids at the end of third grade should go on to fourth grade even though they can't read the math book. We challenged all of that stuff. We changed our education system. We pressured it with school choice. We've had the greatest gains in learning in the last 15 years. And I'm proud of that. If you give parents more options, I can guarantee you one thing. The public schools get better. I'll give you an example. In, anybody here have a child with a, with a learning disability? Every, I mean, there's like, it's 10%, 15% of the, of the student population in most places. And I, I know scores and scores of children who were struggling. In the, in, in the United States, you have a, a civil right to be able to have a contract with the local school board about your child. There has to be a contract. And that contract, if it's not fulfilled, you get into a big argument. A lot of times there's litigation, always a fight. The school districts never like to, to deal with this. The parents are frustrated. So in Florida, we decided to do something different, which is any parent who believes their individual education plan required by federal law that is not being taken care of, if they unilaterally think that, they can send their child to a private school with the state and local dollars. So you would think, wow, that's going to destroy public schools, right? Guess what? The greatest learning gains on the nation's report card tests that you can't teach to, guess which state has the greatest learning gains in reading? F Florida. The public schools got better because, God forbid, if these 30,000 kids would either come back to the school districts or, God forbid, others would leave. Competition and choice empowers quality and improvement, and that's the focus. High expectations, high accountability, more school choice, and if I'm President of the United States, I will fight on behalf of kids that are stuck in failing schools. Not to impose a federal solution, but to make sure that the federal government is a partner for the states that want to have meaningful reform. And as far as I'm concerned, the more radical, the better. Yes? As a veteran, I would just like to hear, uh, hear you address, whoops. Sorry. That's as good. That way everybody I'm can hear you. I'm usually pretty loud. So as a veteran, I'd just like to hear you address the issues with the VA and yep. what you might do to, uh, to alleviate some of those problems. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I think we should all give a round of applause to all of the veterans here today. Thank you. So about six months ago, right in the beginning of my campaign, the first policy rollout we had was uh, a plan to reform the Veterans Administration. And I base this on listening, having roundtable discussions for about a month all around the country, listening to veterans talk about their frustrations, talking to former secretaries of the Veterans Administration and military leaders who are concerned as we draw down our military that the number of veterans now entering the Veterans Administration will overwhelm it, a department already in crisis. And so I crafted a policy. We rolled it out in South Carolina. Uh, and it basically goes like this. First, the Veterans Administration needs career civil service reform. There are 340,000 employees in the Veterans Administration. And while they have shortages in some professional parts of this, the bureaucracy is enormous. And it is slow. It is molasses-like slow. And it is insular. And they've created management uh, uh, reforms in their mind that are completely wrong. $142 million of bonuses went out last year for performance bonuses, including lowering, lessening the waiting lists, lists for veterans. 
Now, we now know that one of the, in some parts of the country, what they did was take people off the waiting list, but not give them care. And veterans died. And you know how many people got fired? Three. Three people. It is shameful. Shameful. To, do, to treat anybody in government, for anybody in government to treat a, a, a client or a person that has earned that support, but most particularly veterans. So first and foremost, we need to have, we need to change the employment law so you don't have lifetime employment, where you reward the people that do good work and you can the people that don't do good work at all. Real quickly, second, veterans are, are deserving of choices. I just brought up school choice for education. It improves quality when parents are empowered to make choices. I can promise you the Veterans Administration would improve its quality if veterans had a choice to go to their private provider or go to a private clinic or go to a private hospital. And that's what we need to do, is not to make it so bureaucratic as it exists today, but it is, it's so bureaucratic, so complex, Again, this insular organization wouldn't consider this an opportunity to serve veterans and give them greater service. They're saying they're threatened, and so they maintain this uh, complex system so that veterans don't have that choice. It should be opened up. It's not to hurt the Veterans Administration. It's to help veterans that this, you know, billions of dollars are spent. Third, I think the Veterans Administration has a huge opportunity to create centers of excellence because now you have big challenges, post-traumatic stress being a, a big, big challenge that is somewhat unique to the next, this current generation of veterans. And they should, they should aspire to have the best quality care with the best research and the best, the best doctors to deal with this and develop best practices to deal with this great challenge. Homeless veterans exist in many cases because of post-traumatic stress and the inability to integrate themselves back into the communities. So take advantage of this opportunity to really soar. I'm not, this is not a negative thing. This is an opportunity, and the resources are there to do it. Another, another great challenge for veterans is now, many veterans would have died in previous wars, and now their lives are being saved, but they have permanent disabilities, long-term permanent disabilities. Families struggle with this, and of course veterans struggle with this. Why not make the Veterans Administration the place in the world to be able to provide support for people that have long-term disability issues? Because it's going to be long-term. And at some point, these folks get abandoned, and that should not happen. The final thing I would suggest is we need to management reform. I don't think the Veterans Administration should be in charge of building any of their buildings. Uh, they have one building in Aurora, Colorado that was supposed to be $300 million. Pretty good size. Anybody in the hospital business knows that's a healthy hospital. Got all the well bells and whistles. They're at $1.8 billion right now. And they haven't gotten the funding from Congress because finally Congress said enough of this nonsense. How do you go from $300 million to $1.8 billion? You can't make that up. That's almost like the cost of the Obamacare website. I mean, <laughs> bringing sound business practices to Washington, D.C may sound like a nerdy thing to do, you know, but it actually is essential. We're way overspending in so many areas. This is sheer incompetence. I think the Army Corps ought to be building, until proven otherwise, we should just move everything over to the Army Corps. They have a much better proven record of building things that are, you know, st stay around for a long while. And then the final thing I'd say is that there are many more women that are, that are now becoming veterans, which is a good thing. Many more enlisted women, and as they leave, I think we have to shift our focus, and I'd like to get your views on this, towards women's health issues as well. The Veterans Administration could play a constructive role there. So stem to stern reform, and it needs a president. There, here's an example. I don't know. There are people that run to the fire, and there are people that run away. You've noticed? When I see a problem, I, my, in, my first impulse is moving forward. Because the greatest joy in service is fixing things, right? I mean, you had a mess. The Department of Homeland Security, it is just like this gigantic beast. There are all sorts of problems that government has. And when you see a problem, the first impulse should be, wow, man, we can do better. We can fix this. I know how to do this. I'm going to bring the best people in to solve it. And I'm going to bang heads until it happens. 
That's how you lead. You can't say the dog ate your homework every day. You can't blame your predecessor every day. Maybe I'm overly sensitive about that. <laughs> Should I be president of the United States? Here's my promise to you. On day one, I will vow that I will not blame my, my predecessor about anything. I will accept personal responsibility for the mess that exists. I know it exists. And my joy will be in fixing it rather than blaming other people for why it exists. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Hi. Am I talking? OK, great. Um, I have a question about your opinion on background checks. Before you answer, let me tell you who I am. Sure. I'm the mother of one child. She was murdered one morning as she was making coffee and studying for school. She was executed. Her only child, my only grandchild, saw this. Mm. And the gunman turned on her and shot her six times. She was left for dead. She survived. I'm not anti-NRA because I know not only is my husband a member of the NRA, <laughs> I know responsible gun owners. I'm also not against their right to bear arms. What I am for is some common sense so that you don't have to look at my eyes. All of you around the room is if any of you have experienced anything what I have that you don't have to have this happen to you. And I just don't think it's unreasonable to step up and do something. I have to have a license to drive a car, please. What's the big deal about background checks? Okay, well, I, I'm happy to answer that and my heart goes out to you and your family. In Florida, we have a 72 hour uh, waiting period and a background check. It's required. And it works. And we're probably, maybe, I don't know, there's, there's a few states that might claim that they're the most pro-Second Amendment states in the country, but Florida certainly ranks as uh, up there high. We have 1.5 million concealed weapon permit holders. We believe in the Second Amendment, but we also believe in background checks. And I don't, I don't have any problem with doing that. And the FDLE, it's our state agency that does it, not the FBI, because the FDLE does it better than the FBI. And I think in general, states um, ought to be able to make these decisions themselves. Here's my problem with President Obama's actions of yesterday and in general when he talks about this. I, I respect the emotion he talked about yesterday. In fact, I, I thought that was, for a guy who's pretty cool, calm, and collected, I like a president that actually showed his heart. Nothing wrong with that at all. But his first impulse, whenever there is a crisis, appears to me to have policies that will take away rights from law-abiding law citizens. And made worse yesterday by, having, by, by using executive power he doesn't have. Look, in our democracy, if you have an idea, and you're president, or you're a governor, or you're a mayor, you go to the legislative body and you try to get it passed. Here's a good example of what President Obama, instead of doing what he did, because it'll be ruled, it'll be overturned in the courts in my mind. He doesn't have this authority. There's no, no law that delegates the authority for him to do this, and certainly the Constitution doesn't, doesn't provide for this. Why not focus on the one thing that there's common ground to deal with these tragic cases that we see on television of these mass murders, which is, the common denominator, by and large, there's other elements of it. Certainly, San Bernardino was, a, is, was an attack of terrorism. But most of these cases, these are deranged people that are severely mentally ill. And we do not have a unified mental health system in this country. We have holes in it. And we have privacy rights that make it harder to identify people when they're getting out of control. And so you have these cases, and we don't have the ability to determine uh, whether people that have mental illnesses are, are actually being able to acquire a gun. Why not focus on that? Because conservatives agree with that. I would agree with that. The NRA might even agree with that, depending on the specifics of the bill. But his impulse is to do the opposite, which is to 
say that if you don't agree with my view, then somehow you don't care about these tragedies as they play out, which is not fair and not true, and makes it harder, the gap just gets wider and wider. So I think in Florida, we dealt with the issue that you're describing, and it works. Look, as I said, no one's saying Florida is not a pro-Second Amendment state, but we do have background checks, and in a big urban kind of state, that's important because people move in and out, and it's important to be able to have that period of time, I think, where you can do the proper background check. Again, I'm sorry for your loss. That's, look, there's a lot of crazy things going on in this world, and each and every day we see them more often now because of the, the focus on these things, and the, it just breaks my heart that we have to even be talking about this, to be honest with you. Yes. I certainly agree with your foreign policy on uh, Syria. I think that's a great idea. And I was just actually wondering about another um, current foreign event or uh, foreign issue with China. Uh, what is your current stance on the United States relationship with China, uh, especially with the prospect of cyber attacks and its economic manipulation last year that put the stock market in quite a dizzy? Yeah, so China is going to be, for the next several decades, it's all li it's all, in, in all likelihood, China is probably going to be the most complex and maybe most important relationship the United States will have. The two largest economies, and that will stay the, the same for, for a long while, uh, we're intertwined economically. Uh, there, are, there are real challenges. Uh, China's worldview is not shaped by little l liberal democracy. It's shaped by a much more centralized, controlled economy. Uh, intellectual property isn't, doesn't appear to have the same value as, as it does here. They're hu the cyber efforts that they're making um, are, are big challenges uh, for, for our country. So here's, here's what I think we ought to do. One, when we say we pivot to Asia, which we did with great grandiosity, we ought to do it if we're going to do it. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have made the statement of a pivot just because I've talked to a lot of people in Asia I used to I do biz, I did business there and I traveled there a lot. What they said was, you talk about pivoting to Asia, but in the region, but no one seems to be talking about pivoting to Asia, you know, when no when Asians aren't watching. Doesn't seem to be as high priority, and they're right. There wasn't a big pivot to Asia. So if you're going to do it, and if, by the way, a pivot also means you're leaving something else, and so the rest of the world's wondering, well, why are you leaving? Why are you abandoning Middle East? Why are you abandoning Europe? This is not, the role of the United States isn't to pick and choose the places where they work. It's in our economic interest and our security interest to be engaged in Asia. And I think we should do it to counter the influence of China in the world. And it's in our economic interest to do so. So if we're going to engage with China, it should be comprehensive. There should be complete dialogue. But we should recognize that they're a competitor, not an ally. And that we should be, we should have our guard up. We need to rebuild our military. The idea that we have to announce that we're sending naval vessels through international waters, which we now have to do because we feel like that's a sign of strength, that's a sign of weakness. To actually announce that you're going through international waters, it actually confers some legitimacy to, to China's claims. The fact that they would build an island 100 miles off the coast of the South China Sea in the middle of, of uh, the ocean where trading patterns are the largest in the world, where volumes of trade take place, we should just do that as a matter of course. We should fly planes over those islands as a matter of course. We should make it clear to our friends that we have their back, the Japanese, the Koreans. We see the upheaval in the world when we pull back, North Korea being the most recent example. So we have to be engaged with China, but from a position of strength. We have to rebuild our Navy and military to make that happen. The final thing I'd say is the, the Chinese don't understand anything about us, based on my experience, and we don't understand anything about them. And that's dangerous. So Hank Paulson had this strategy that I thought was appropriate, this former Secretary of Treasury, which was to have ongoing dialogue so that the, any misunderstanding didn't go and create an, a larger problem. And I'll give you one quick example of that. When the President Obama got reelected, he had a summit with President Xi, the newly uh, minted president of China. And they did it at, uh, in Palm Springs. It was a big deal in China. I was there. And Mrs. Obama didn't go to this summit, this weekend summit, where the two presidents and families were going to get together and get to know each other. In China, that was very important. 
In the United States, clearly it wasn't. Mrs. Obama had other things to do. So every meeting that I went to, and I went to way too many of them, we spent the first 10 minutes where I got lambasted because our country insulted their glamorous first lady and insulted the first family of China and insulted China. And I'm going, look, I'm not a big fan, as you noticed, of, of President Obama, but I'm defending President Obama and Mrs. Obama saying, there's no way that Michelle Obama is going to go out of her way to insult the first lady of China. She might have had the same challenge that a lot of families have in the United States, and it brought back memories of having to do my kids' science projects because they refused to do them. <laughs> you know, think about it. There's a lot of, she had two teenage daughters. I'm sure she had something going on with her family that was really important. We all have that experience. The Chinese would have never thought that because our culture is different than theirs. So engagement has got to be essential in that regard. Yeah. Um, I don't know where You're to begin, sir. Uh, more question. I have this. It's a gift for you. Thank you. A copy of that was given to your brother. Be Why don't you begin near the end? <laughs> that's, that's pretty close. <laughs> okay. uh, that's for you. It's a series hey, of poems and a quote oh, from a statesman. And my only question for you is, I grew up, I'm 55 or so, year old guy, New England kid. I lived five years in Tallahassee while you were governor down south, and I saw your actions firsthand. I stood this far away from you for the longest time. You had a t-shirt on, sweating, doing your thing. And I grew to admire you then and there, well before you ever started running for president, Mr. Bush. My compliments. I, I watched you as a person who went. Thank you. Was uh, I, this must have been the skinny jab before I got fat. And I, well, <laughs> I was chosen, chosen by an organization to go down there and work as a rescue worker for Katrina. Oh, wow. And, uh, two days after Katrina. So it was, it was a... Uh, it was a nightmare, wasn't it? So, it, you know, I, without your actions, the federal government kind of dropped the ball with that whole thing going on. And if it weren't for your facilitation of people and uh, <laughs> resources, I, don't, I really don't know how that whole panhandle of Florida into Biloxi thing would have worked out. It was your leadership that really helped a lot with that whole transition. And then the influx of people. I almost got a feel for what what it must have been like to live in another country, like in the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East, where an influx of human beings, souls, poured through I-10, through Tallahassee. They did. Hundreds of thousands of people coming, and I, I lived right there as you come down the, the Big Bend off the I-10 uh, exit, and uh, people were mobbing the hotels, and dogs, and this and that, and pet alligators, and it was just the most unbelievable thing. They're I'd from saw. Louisiana, so. <laughs> So as a New England man, I, I grew up kind of an old-fashioned way. And, and just to be quick, I don't want to take up much of your time, but this woman kind of touched me. And uh, earlier I spoke to some people filming questions. Um, I'm a God-fearing man. I'm a radically Christian guy. And I respected my dad, um, who wasn't. I respected Mr. Ferreira, who lived down the street. And when he saw one of us doing something wrong, he'd come over, grab us by the ear, <laughs> and march us home. And when he dumped me off on the front doorstep, my father would say, Joe, what did he do? No, it's all right, Charlie, no problem. And then, uh, you know, I was held accountable. I don't believe that, uh, that guns or weapons have anything to do with some of these things that we see on the TV every day, but psychosis might have a lot to do with it. Yeah. And a, a, a departure from godliness, a departure from the church, a departure from the, the, the American family, an absolute departure from the American family. Um, I was blown to smithereens that we started off this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And as everybody realized, it says, one nation under God, indivisible. It's a nation under God, indivisible. And Jeb Bush, I believe that you would stand up for people like me and defend our rights as much as they are founded in our nation's history. I believe that you, personally, as a man of integrity, I believe in you you would stand up for our rights because we have now become the minority. Thank you. Right. Couple, couple, couple of points, a couple of quick points. One, um, the Bill of Rights is, the Constitution is a blueprint that we should cherish. We should cherish it. We shouldn't just say, oh, this is an interesting document. Mm -hmm. Some countries have constitutions that are constantly amended to the point where it's like, they have to redo the Constitution because it becomes 2,000 pages long. It loses its value. Our Constitution is, is, should be cherished and respected. 
And the right of religious freedom is called the first freedom because it is at the heart of who we are as a nation. The whole Bill of Rights is important, but the right of being able not just to have a religious faith, I mean, there are people literally that say, get over it, you know, you can, it's okay to have a belief, but you gotta keep it in your church pews or your synagogues or, you know, or at home. And that, that is not what the first freedom is all about. The first freedom is allowing people religious conscience, which means that they have the right to act on their faith. And they, should, they can do it in the public square. And in a tolerant, big, diverse country, people have to be accepting of the fact that not everybody has faith as their organizing principle, but those that do have faith have the exact same rights to be able to act on their faith. And we can solve this problem. This is not the most complex problem in our country, but to exclude people of faith from the public square, I think we do it at our own peril. Because there's a lot of people that act on their faith to take care of the homeless, to feed the hungry, to take care of children that have been abandoned, neglected, and abused, or to commit to improving the quality of the environment. Whatever it is, a lot of times it's motivated by faith, and every time you limit someone's actions in that regard, I think you limit the ability to solve problems the way Americans have always done it. Second story, and this one relates to um, Katrina, because I'm doing this in honor of uh, Secretary Shertoff. Uh, Katrina was going to hit Pensacola. We had, a, we had a Cat 4 storm that hit Pensacola the year before. It was wiped out already. Had that storm hit uh, at the power that it was planning to hit, it was, it was the largest storm, I think, in American history recorded. It was a Cat 5 and a half, if you will. And it was heading right towards Pensacola. So we mobilized support. We had, we had 600 people at the armory of the Florida National Guard in Tallahassee, and we shipped them out. We had DMATs. We had all this stuff that we were so good at because we had a lot of practice. We had disaster management teams. We had the evacuation teams. We had everybody going, and I sent them off going west. The storm waggles to the east and, and then it, or west, and then it waggles back. back. It hits Mississippi. And so it wasn't going to hit Pensacola. And Craig Fugate, who's now the head of FEMA for uh, uh, for President Obama was my director of emergency management. He calls me and says, we've got, I don't know, a thousand people prepared to provide support, but it's in Mississippi. And there are no rules that allow a state to do this. We have cooperative agreements, but they're not about the first response. What should we do? And I said, keep going west. <laughs> keep going west. The first responders in the six counties of southern Mississippi that had storm surge 20 feet high, 20 miles inland. I think, I think I-10 is about 20 miles inland. You can still see where the surge went up, almost above the overpasses. I mean, this was an incredible storm, water just piling up. It wiped out everything. Police cars were up in trees. There were no police officers. There were no firefighters. There were no city managers. It was wiped out. The first responders, the first police officers, firefighters, city managers, everything were from Florida. And it was because we knew how to do it. We were trained and we had leadership and people accepted personal responsibility and they went at it. And I think a lot of lives were saved because of that. And you never heard about it. True. Never heard about it. Now, the end of the story, because I got to tell this to Shertoff was, we actually didn't get reimbursed. We didn't know if we were going to get reimbursed because there were no rules about this. And uh, a year and a half later, we got a $135 million check to reimburse us for the effort because we ended up having like 3,000 people in southern Mississippi to take care of this. I just want to say that's how government should work. Occasionally, you kind of have to break the china break the rules a little bit, not, not to do something for your own self, but break the rules on behalf of people. We need a government that is not our master, but is our servant again. And I think the Katrina experience as it relates to Florida is a good example of how it can work. Yes, sir. If you were elected president, um, would you make steps to fix welfare, and if so, what would those steps be? Yeah, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm um, unveiling a welfare reform proposal. Anybody that's, uh, that loves policy 
It's a little nerdy, a little wonky. Uh, I am. I just raised my hand. I admit it. Uh, go to Jeb2016.com, and you will see the most comprehensive, detailed plans for uh, everything from Western lands policy to the Veterans Administration to entitlements. And tomorrow we unveil our welfare reform uh, proposal in advance of a poverty summit that's taking place in uh, Columbia, South Carolina on Saturday that uh, Jimmy Kemp, Jack, Jack Kemp's son, uh, and uh, Paul Ryan and Tim Scott, the senator from South Carolina, are hosting. So I'm excited about that because I think that's one of the great challenges of our time. Today, if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor than any time in American history. And if you're in the middle, you're getting squeezed. That's the simple fact. We've lost upward social mobility. And it has always defined our country, at least the mythology around America is, doesn't matter where you start, right? Doesn't matter what zip code you're born in. It's what you do that will define your success. Increasingly, we're finding people stuck. And part of it is the trillion dollars a year of transfer payments to try to provide for people in poverty is actually putting limits on people's possibilities rather than a floor for their aspirations. And I think we need dramatic welfare reform, call it 2.0. One of the great social policy changes that took place was in the 1990s when Newt Gingrich and the Republican-led uh, Congress passed welfare reform. President Clinton vetoed it twice and then realized, hey, this is good politics, supported it, and it was a huge success. Welfare rolls declined in Florida by 90%. And it changed to a work-related program. Here's what our proposal will lay out. There are three things that will lift people out of poverty. Work, marriage, and a high school education, at least. You do those three things, and it, it gives you a giant leap forward uh, in terms of the probabilities of being lifted out of poverty. And we need to also recognize that there are a whole lot of people that are on the bubble, if you will, between the middle class and poverty, as defined by these federal programs. And they're doing this on their own. They're making ends meet. They're one paycheck or two paychecks away from disaster. Do you think it's fair for people who are working and struggling to get unfavorable treatment compared to people who receive benefits without the work requirement? I think it's important to lift people out of poverty. It's the right, it's the right position, but it's also a question of fairness and equity. We shouldn't force people to say that I have to not work in order to get a better economic deal. That's wrong. So a total recasting of our, of our, of our transfer payments. And also dealing with the massive fraud and abuse that exists in these programs. And be serious about it. The UK went through welfare reform when David Cameron got elected. The conservative got elected to, the, to become prime minister. And they had welfare programs far higher, bigger uh, than ours. And it was a big problem for the UK, the United Kingdom, because they were, they were on their knees, basically, economically, and their debt levels were way too high. So he did something interesting. He didn't cut welfare benefits. What he did was require everybody to go through the eligibility process again. And what they found in England, in the United Kingdom, was that there were 20, I think, percent people that were receiving benefits that weren't deserving of it. And bringing back that proper balance where you're eliminating fraud and abuse and providing support for people that truly need it, which is essential, I think, in a just society, but then not putting ceilings on people's aspirations has to be how we go about this going forward. Final thing I'd say is, just like the Veterans Administration can't organize themselves out of a wet paper bag, our, tra our, our welfare system is, doesn't embrace technology as it should as well. Much of these programs ought to be shifted back to the states, and what we ought to do is use 21st century solutions of technology to be able to administer them. The administration costs of food stamps and these other programs is in the billions of dollars, and the error rates are way too high. I would like to be able to do the following, which is to say, if we weren't doing it this way, how would we do it? How many, how many people have had that chance in life? That's one of the greatest exciting things in the world, right? to have the ability to say, let's start from scratch and create whatever it is that, that we're trying to create without all the vestiges of legacy costs and mindsets that are tied to the past. That's how you move forward. And I think we should do that with our welfare systems to give people the dignity of support that they deserve, but not a ceiling 
simply a floor so that they can go way beyond uh, where they are today. And I'm glad you asked that question because I'm excited about going Saturday to, to lay this out. The final thing is education reform, back to the, the first question, we have to revolutionize how we educate. If you think a child that can't re it reads at fifth grade level, even if they have a high school degree, because we have, we have schools, we have states that will have such low expectations. You can pass, you can graduate from high school, but you can't read at a sixth grade level. Who's fooling who? Who's, that, that child will never be able to fill out a form to get a job. And then we blame everybody else why that happens. When I was governor, we had an eighth grade level high school graduation test. And that was actually better than some states that had no graduation test requirements. And I was in a, I was in a lab for a kid that was taking, practicing for the last chance he had to pass. He'd already graduated. He had, he, you know, he, somehow he made B's and A's. Uh, he graduated. He made all the course credits passing. But he couldn't pass this eighth grade level test. He had one more shot at it. And I'm looking over his shoulder, and the question is, a baseball game starts at 3, it ends at 4.30. How long is the game? He couldn't answer it. That America is America and an America that dooms to fail. That child was deserving of teachers and parents and our society that says, we want to have expectations up here, not down here. It's time we stop dumbing down everything and recognize that children are smarter than we give them credit for and hold them to higher expectations and everybody should be held to higher expectations. That was a tragedy, and that should never happen in this country. And if we want to lift people out of poverty, then we have to give them the skills to achieve earned success. Too many kids don't. <laughs> yes, sir. Is that a Patriots hat you're wearing? Yes. That's such a surprise in New Hampshire. I, I, I've never... <laughs> First of all, I wanted to thank you for coming. Uh, second of all, my name is Tom Emanuel, and I'm a selectman in Laconia. Hey. I'm leaning towards uh, Donald Trump, and I was, I was just wondering, I was wondering why you think he's a jerk. <laughs> Let's see how much time we have. Look, let me say some nice things about Donald Trump first. I'm trying to, th I got this looming presence of my mother behind me. By the way, don't ask, don't ask my mother what she thinks. That would... I like the fact that he is not embarrassed about his success. I think too many people, I think we ought to be, you know, celebrating success in life. I think it's great that he's been successful. Wonderful. I mean, and, and he maybe exaggerates his success a bit and all that, but it's good. It's a healthy thing. It's an American thing to, to be successful and to be proud of it. I like the fact, to a limit, that he is politically incorrect. Because we're way too uptight. And there is no leeway anymore about expressing your views. There's no margin of error. And everybody assumes that you're, you know, you're hateful or you're a racist or whatever it is. And while he's exaggerated in this way over the top exaggerated, the fact that he has made a contribution to kind of loosen things up a little bit, I think that's good. Here's why I called him a jerk. And I'm serious about this. And it troubled me. I spent eight years, as I said, I believe, I believe life is precious. I think life is truly a gift from God. And the disabled compared to the, men, you know, the smartest person on the world, we're all equal under God's watchful eye. That's what I believe. And it is a deeply held view. And when anybody, anybody disparages people with disabilities, it sets me off. That's why I called him a jerk, because he disparaged a person who he knew had a disability and made fun of him. What kind of person would you want to have in the presidency that does that? Do you want a president that disparages women, Muslims of all kinds, people with disabilities, Hispanics? I mean, we're getting down to about 90% of all people here. I mean, at what point do we say, enough of this? Let's start solving problems. You don't solve problems the way Barack Obama operates. He doesn't use that terminology, but he divides us up. He pushes down people that, that don't agree with him. 
And you're not going to do it the way Donald Trump does it either. If we're going to solve problems and rise up again as a nation, we need someone who has a completely different approach. Someone who has a servant's heart. Someone who doesn't think it's about them. Someone who has a proven record. Someone who knows what he doesn't know. Donald Trump in the debate last week, and this is important as we look at the possibility, and I'm not certain because we only had news reports and you, you got to get this stuff verified, that North Korea has, has uh, tested a hydrogen bomb, which is a step way beyond where they were before, if it's accurate. And I think when you're asked the question about the nuclear triad and its importance, when you're running for president of the United States, you better have a pretty good answer because at the heart of it, if you ask the president to do one thing, it is to keep us safe. And the nuclear triad is a means by which we have been kept safe since the, since the post-World War II era. And modernizing our nuclear weapons and making sure that we have the deterrent effect that's necessary is important. And go back and rewind the tape about what Donald Trump said about the nuclear triad. And you tell me if he's qualified right now to be president of the United States. Is he a smart guy? Yeah. Will he be able to learn about this? I don't know. Maybe if he takes the time to do it. But he sure as heck better if he's going to be president because we all want a president that has a steady hand as it relates to something as serious as that. We're living in serious times, and I think we need a serious candidate. And I want your vote. I'm going to, I'm going to track you down, and I'm going to get you to support me. You're on my list now, brother. Yeah. Um, well, wait for the mic. I'll turn back here this for a little bit now. <laughs> You're next. Um, I am a political science student. I'm a graduating senior. What school? James Madison University. Great, um, great name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I am pretty discouraged to maybe start a career in politics just because of the polarization um, and all the disagreement that we see today yeah. in our government. Um, so I think that it's really important to have a leader that can bring the two sides together like you were speaking about. But I just wanted to know a little bit more about how you're going to compromise beyond starting on that common ground and get uh, people more towards the middle and working together rather than pushing people apart. Sure. Well, first, uh, I hope you if you have a passion for politics, I hope you're not discouraged by the, uh, the craziness of this campaign, because this will change. It always does. Campaigns never stay static. And I think there's, a, there's going to be a sobriety kind of that kicks in, and people are going to take it seriously, because we are living in dangerous times. And as you get closer, you want to know who's going to sit behind the big desk and make tough decisions, and who has, that, who has those leadership skills. Secondly, if you're interested in politics, I wouldn't necessarily uh, migrate to the federal government anyway. <laughs> because when I'm elected president, we're going to shift power away from Washington as far as possible and shift it back to places that I know work. It works in Florida. It works in New Hampshire. Why is it, why is it that, that budgets are balanced? Budgets are passed at the state level. I mean, now they're not even passed in Washington. Why is it that city councils and mayors pass budgets and no, you know, no violence occurs. There's no food fights. There's arguing and there's debating, for sure. That's a democracy. It's not beanbag here. You know, politics is rough and tumble. But it, it works. Our political system works, except it doesn't work right now in Washington. So my, my encouragement to you would be, go work for President Morse, and you'll find how democracy works the right way, because um, it, it does work. So how do, you, how do you change the culture in Washington? One, is, one important point is to shift power away from Washington. It's too big. The way they compromise is basically, I mean, think about it. You're at the kitchen table. You're with your spouse. You have a challenge. You've got a finite amount of money. You both have competing interests in what you want to do. Does this sound familiar? This is how life works for most of us, right? And you decide you're going to do it the Washington way, which is compromise is, I get what I want, and you get what you want. 
That's how they solve problems, and the deficit grows. That's not, that's not solving problems. Democracy means you have to forge consensus in a, in a way uh, that, that, that recognizes there's a finite sum of money. So shifting power away from Washington would be a powerful first step. Secondly, don't ascribe bad motives to people that disagree with you, because they are normally have the same sincere desire that you have. They just have a very different view. And if you're wrong about that, so be it. That doesn't change anything. Look, if Barack Obama has evil motives, which I don't think he does, but if he does, it doesn't change anything that, you know, my motivation towards him doesn't change what he's doing. The important thing is to assume people of goodwill of different views exist because that's the only way you can reweave kind of the culture of consensus making. And then third, strike when the iron's hot. Mental health is a good issue that we could do right now. And the president, um, I'll give you another one. The whole restorative justice movement, right on crime, was five years ago, led in Texas, conservative Texas decided that they were sentencing too many people to, with minimum mandatory sentences. And they began the process of changing that and they're reducing their prison population. Now there's a growing movement on the right to be able to replicate that, including federal sentencing guidelines. Where half the people sentenced in our federal prisons now are there for drug-related use. Well, Barack Obama believes in the same thing from a different perspective. His approach, though, is, of course, not to actually interact with people that disagree with him and everything else. God forbid it, he could find common ground with, with conservatives on a subject. So he's using the clemency process and circumventing the Congress, even when they support the idea. So whenever there is a consensus, and believe me or not, you know, trust me, there are, there are a lot of places where there is bipartisan consensus. At least do that. And then set the stage to build for the bigger things. You can't do this overnight, but a president is the only person because it's a, the institution is, is occupied by one person. The president has to take the first step. And I live by the, by the principle, how do you know unless you try? How do you know unless you try? We got a lot of yappers. Man, we've got, we've got more eloquent or not so eloquent. We got a lot of talkers. People are really good at it. And then there's you know, 24 hours on every cable news station to fill it up. So we get, we get our healthy dose of people talking and talking and talking. We now have to create a culture of doing. That's what we need. And I think I have those skills to do it. Yes, sir. Good luck with your career. Don't, don't give up. Is that joke of a presidential candidate if Donald Trump actually somehow wins the Republican nomination, would you be willing to try and seek it out as a third party candidate? No. And secondly, what would you do to take on lobbyists and outside influence in Washington and the campaign? So, did everybody hear the first part? I want to make sure that they heard that. <laughs> if, I'm not going to run as a third party candidate no matter who wins the nomination. I'm a Republican, man. I've been supporting Republicans since Richard Nixon. Here. I'm that old. I've been, a, I've been a fighter for the conservative cause once I figured it out. Once I believed and understood the power of limited government, of personal responsibility, of individual freedom being the catalyst for most of the good things that happen in this country, uh, it, I'm all, I've been all in and I'm still all in. And I'm not going to change. Uh, and I'm going to defend the conservative cause against people who aren't conservative. They're trying to hijack it. That's what I'm going to do. And along the way, I think I'm going to win the nomination to make it even better. So that's, that's, that's my position. <laughs> Lobbyists, the second part of this are how do, we, how do we restrain the power of lobbyists? We first restrain it by shrinking government. The reason why lobbyists are more powerful is that government's more powerful. So you have to hire a lobbyist actually to interact with it. Government has gotten so complex, our society is complex, but nothing near the complexity of, of Washington. And so I think if you shift power through you know, eliminating programs, and more importantly, shifting power back to the states, just sending the money back without strings attached, you're going to lessen the influence of lobbyists, at least in Washington, D.C. They may actually show up more in Concord. I don't know. Uh, but in Florida, what we did was we, we created a more transparent um, requirement for lobbyists. And I think we should do that in Washington, D.C. One idea is to have any, action, any interaction with a high staff member or an elected official by a lobbyist, they ought to have that online within 24 hours to make sure that we know 
because there, there's an assumption of all sorts of bad things going on. Transparency will open it up and people can make their own judgment. In Florida, we actually require the list of, of names of the clients that lobbyists have and a kind of range of income that they make. That was supposed to be a really onerous thing. The lobbyists all got crazy. And then they realized, hey, now we're going to make public the money we're making. And to show how successful we are, we want to be at the top of the list, not at the bottom of the list. <laughs> but the fact is, it's transparent. Everybody knows. So just opening up the, the, um, the shades a little bit is part of this as well. And then frankly, I think that lobbyists shouldn't be elected officials. There should be a six-year lobbying ban by elected officials. They should not go out the back door and start lobbying their successors. I know a lot of formers in the Congress, and they're good people. And they served, most of them served with honor, and they did it the best they could. Most of them need to go back to their communities and add value to the communities that they were serving. And I think that would help them, and it certainly would deal with this issue of the revolving door that, uh, that is just ridiculous. I think there needs to be procurement reform if you're interested in lobbying. Why do you have to hire a lobbyist to actually get a government contract? The ultimate form of a business-like approach to how you procure services and, and things in general would be that you don't hire lobbyists because you, get, you have the lowest price with the highest quality. And now, the complexity of how procurement takes place from the Defense Department across the spectrum of government is absurd. It increases costs dramatically, and it hurts taxpayers, and it extends the time in which things happen. If you want to do an information system for the Department of Defense or the Veterans Administration, it takes an act of God and about 20 lobbyists. And it'll take 10 years for the thing to finally be done. That has to be eliminated. It doesn't happen at, at big corporations. Why should it happen with, with a large government entity? Because we've allowed it to happen. If we're going to change how we grow our economy, we first have to change the culture in Washington. And front and center would be the kind of reforms I just outlined. Now, do you have an idea about it that you could add to my repertoire that I can use at the next town hall meeting? <laughs> Well, okay, jeb at jeb.org is my email address if you've got any ideas. I'm, I'm all in. Yes, sir. Back to the Middle East. The current sovereign states in the Middle East and boundaries were created in the aftermath of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire by the winners, the Allies. And they were somewhat artificial at the time. Now we can see there are stresses, internal stresses and strains uh, between religion, tribes, economic interests, and so forth. Uh, and this has the potential to go on ad infinitum. Would you su consider supporting an international, long-term diplomatic effort to realign those boundaries to reflect reality 100 years later? Great question, because um, it does appear that these boundaries uh, look a lot more artificial today than they did when they were created. And uh, you have the Shia-Sunni fight that is accelerated, partially because of our departure from the scene, where the Saudis no longer feel like there's a security umbrella and they're, they're acting in their own interests as they see fit. You have the Iranians aggressively pursuing their agenda that's in direct conflict with, with uh, the Arab world. So apart from the geography issues, the, the border issues that you're talking about, you also have these ongoing religious conflicts that, that add a complexity to this. If you look at Iraq, you have, you have the Kurdish areas, the Sunni areas, the Shia areas, a centralized government that was fragile and working until we left again and didn't allow it to nurture. And so now you see um, a possibility. At, at a minimum, there ought to be greater autonomy. And possibly that moves towards sovereignty. I'm not, I'm not proposing that today, because I think the upheaval of that and the risk of that could be great as well. But the idea of a commission to gradually move towards it, that, that sounds like something that would be more, you know, lessen the downside of this. But we're not going to solve these problems unless the Arab world 
begins to realize that they, they cannot have this unilateral imposition of their ideology or their religion on people that don't agree with it inside their country. And it doesn't appear they're capable of doing that right, right now. I mean, there are examples that are to the opposite. Uh, Syria lost that capability. They did have some of that. Uh, Lebanon had it, but now it seems to be lost. Egypt, when the Muslim Brotherhood were there, um, were, were on the run to, 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 um, to damage the cops, which was 10% of the population. Now that al-Sisi's there, that seems to be restored. So country by country is different, but I think you're absolutely right that this is one of the great challenges for stability in the Middle East is that these boundaries don't reflect the cultural, ethnic, uh, and religious differences that exist. So you got another question or comment? This is a completely different area. President Obama has retired a number of military leaders who actually fought. Now, one had a staff that said nasty things about him. Yeah. Another was, uh, I believe, the excuse was an admiral in charge of a battle group used abusive language. Uh, I don't know how you get to, in the Navy to get I don't to think in the Navy without, you, without that's using ever abusive allowed, language. But uh, <laughs> anyway, he, he, was, he was not. And on and on and on. Given the conditions of the world today, and you alluded to that, what do you look for in your top military leaders? Well, that's two for two in terms of high quality questions. First, uh, I think the commander in chief should have the obligation to support the military and not impose non-military social kind of an agenda or a political agenda on top of them. There should not be, it should not be, you look, you're now working for me, this is, these are the conditions in which you have to operate and here are the, the conditions that the fighting force has to operate. It should be the other way around, which is give me options to achieve the desired ultimate uh, effect, which is how do we create a force level that is the strongest to deter military action? How do we do that? If you start with that premise, then you allow for the military to, um, to have the leaders emerge, not to pick them based on their loyalty to you, but based on their leadership skills. Um, one of the great examples of this was a book uh, that, I, that I read about uh, Marshall and in, uh, in how he selected leaders. And I think that's the appropriate place. He didn't pick people because they were three stars about, you know, they deserved to be a four star. He picked people that had true leadership skills and put them in positions of responsibility. And it worked in, in, in a very extraordinary way. Uh, for our fighting force uh, in, in you know, World War II. So I, I think we should, I'm not saying the commander in chief can't be hands off, but it ought to be in, there, there ought to be a deference to the military, and you ought to, but you ought to ultimately say, what are the options to achieve this objective? And then hold them to account about doing it. You should not impose a political kind of uh, environment on top of them. The other thing which is a corollary to this is I think our National Security Council is way too big. Is it's doubled in size, it's politicized. I mean, they actually put political hacks inside of it, people that worked in the campaign. I'm not sure that they have the skill sets necessary to deal with advising the president with competing interests as it relates to foreign policy or defense policy or intelligence policy. It's a hugely important role, but it shouldn't be centralized so that all the power exists in the White House. And that's what's happened. You talk to every Secretary of Defense that has served in the Obama administration that's out, and they're all either mildly or highly critical of their experience because of the imposition of a bunch of political whippersnappers that came and told them what to do. That has to stop. I think the presidency is better served by having strong leaders at state and at the Defense Department and have a really good person that coordinates the foreign policy and defense policy at the National Security Agency not dictating it. Does that make sense? Yes, you, you can, if you've got a third question because you've asked two good ones. <laughs> Governor, we have time for one more question, please. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the traditional conservative message of strong family, religious freedom, and economic growth is one that is very appealing to immigrants. 
And yet, when you and your fellow candidates stand up there on the debates that we've all watched, you manage to, to tell immigrants to go away. I do. No, well, the general, the, the hey, general hey, tone, hey, come I'm on, not brother. saying you do. The general tone well, is you go did. away. You said me, and I'm going to just, I, I'm, calling, the, I'm calling a 15-yard penalty loss and down. <laughs> um, how do you square that circle? Because if you're going to achieve your ambitious goal of 4% growth, you've got to be able to do that. I wrote a book about it. Take a look at it. It's called Immigration Wars, and it was written to create a conservative alternative that would be the catalyst for a legal system that will help create economic growth, not be a drain on our society, but actually be a catalyst for high sustained economic growth. Chapter one, you can buy it for a buck 99 on Amazon. This guy already bought his, I'm gonna give it back to him. <laughs> and uh, here's, here's, here's something just to consider. I wrote this book four years ago, five years ago. It's not a bestseller, I know, I got that. <laughs> and my views are still the same. The views I hold are the views that I hold. If you're looking for a president that actually has conviction, has a backbone, if you will, that won't bend with the times, won't mirror, you know, try to mirror people's sentiment today, then you're looking at the guy running for president that is that guy. And on immigration, it's a good example. I laid out in detail a plan how to control the border, how to deal with illegal immigration, how to create a path to legal status, not citizenship. And I did this five years ago. My views are my views. They're the same views I had. Name another candidate running for president on the Republican nomination that has the same views they had five years ago, or three years ago, or a couple of months ago. <laughs> Look, this is a leading indicator of how a president will act. If you're running for president and you feel that, oh my gosh, people are going to be so angry, you can't persuade them towards your view, and you just change your views in order to stay out of the, you know, the whirlwind, how are you going to deal with Putin? Putin smells this. He just smells it. He, sm he smells weakness. And he goes right at it. We do not need a president that is always going to change with the times, that adjust their views based on public sentiment. Because guess what happens? Public sentiment changes. You're never going to be able to keep up with how people think, because they change their thinking based on the conditions that they see. A leader shouldn't mirror how people think. A leader should lead. A leader should have core convictions and change the environment by persuading people about the right thing. And you're absolutely right. Immigration could be a tool for high sustained economic growth. And if we're interested in the fact, here's a, here's a proposal, a Bush proposal. 10 years from now, my hope and dream is that everybody in this room will be 10 years older. <laughs> Anybody got a position on that? I'm for it at least, I hope you all are as well. And if that's the case, then our demographic pyramid that used to look like this, starting to look like this. <laughs> I mean, we're going from 19 to 1 when Social Security was started to 3 to 1, going past 3 to 1, ultimately to 2 to 1. And if you take the children out of that equation, you begin to see that every, ta every working person is basically taking care of one person. And that's not possible. It's not sustainable over the long haul. How do we reverse that? Well, we create, we, we form more families. We increase our fertility rate. We broaden the number of young people that have aspirations to pursue their dreams, to rebuild the demographic pyramid. And in our country, if we expect this to happen just by ourselves, it, so far, it didn't work. And in fact, the birth rate in this country is now below break even, first time that I'm aware of in, in modern history. If you want to restore the demographic pyramid, then we need to control illegal immigration and make sure that coming here legally is easier than coming here illegally and then narrow the number of people coming by family petitioning and expand the number of people coming for economic purposes that are aspirational, that will set up businesses, that will form families, that will have children, that will rebuild the demographic pyramid along with native-born Americans. That is the path to a better immigration policy. And it's embedded in my book, Immigration Wars, buck 99 on Amazon. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, whether it's ISIS or this, I think one of the measurements that people in New Hampshire are going to look for is, who has the steady hand? Who's thought it through? 
Whether you agree with everything that I say or not, I hope you give me credit that I believe what I believe. And I'm not going to bend with the times. I'm not going to bend because someone comes up to me and says, you're an idiot or whatever, you know, occasionally happens. That's not how you lead. There are a lot tougher challenges than dealing with people that disagree with you on immigration. And I think, I think that is a sign of strength, not weakness, to stick for what you believe. So I appreciate the question. Thank you all very much. Thanks for being here. God bless you all. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.